Hello everyone, good uh, evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending upon where you might be. We would like to welcome you to week three for the post-crisis hospitality management certificate program. My name is Dr. Jihan Chobanolu. I'm the McKibben and Dodd Chair Professor and the Director of M3 Center. Today, we have br brought you a wonderful program. Uh, this certificate program is put together by the University of South Florida, MoMA College of Business, the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. Uh, today, we are going to have a pre-show before our third lecture, uh, and the pre-show we will be uh, hosting Mr. Kenneth Felt, Chairman and the CEO of Felt Entertainment Incorporated. He will be hosted by the MoMA College of Business Dean Moez Limayem. Before I invite Dean Limayem, I would like to show you uh, a short video about Felt Entertainment. Our most important goal when we produce a show is the audience. And it's to make the audience wonder, be amazed, so they go home with something that they can hold forever. Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Regardless of where you are, we're just thrilled to have you uh, today. Um, again, my name is Mo Asli Mayim. I'm the very proud dean of the um, University of South Florida MUMA College of Business. And welcome, welcome to the thousands of participants from more than 100 um, uh, countries. We're just thrilled to have you, so happy to have you uh, with us today. I hope you enjoyed the first two weeks, but hey, there is more, wait, there is more. And it, uh, you're in for a true treat today. I cannot believe how excited, how happy uh, today uh, to um, uh, host one of absolutely my favorite uh, uh, leaders um, in, in our uh, community and in our state and maybe even in our uh, country. Let me uh, tell you, you probably saw this uh, short video. It says uh, Monster Jam, Monster Energy, Supercross, Amsoil, Disney on Ice, uh, Disney Live, Sesame Street. Regardless where they are, I am sure you've heard and maybe you were lucky enough like me to watch some of these shows. Well, guess what? Today, we're going to um, interview, and we have our, our guest, the man who's in charge of it all. The man who took over from his father, Irvin Feld, who acquired um, the Ringling Bro and, and Barham and, and Bailey Circus in 1967, where uh, Irvin Feld uh, created and founded Feld Entertainment. And uh, Mr. Kenneth Feld, my guest, my friend, today um, took it over and really made it the huge success it is today. We're talking here about very wise, humble, true leader, one of the nicest people you can ever meet, one of the wisest people you can ever meet, and really insightful working alongside his three daughters, Juliet, Nicole, and uh, Elena, they run Felt Entertainment like nobody else can. So please help me give a very warm University of South Florida, Muma College of Business welcome 
to Mr. Kenneth Pelt. Thank you very much, Mars. Thank you for having me, and I'm anxious to talk to everybody from around the world. Thank you, Kenneth. So uh, I'm just so happy. Every time I, I see my friend Kenneth, I'm excited. The only problem is we can take forever. So we're going to try to touch uh, <laughs> on, on really important points, but also we will be taking some uh, questions. So as you see there, please tweet your questions. And um, Kenneth promised me that he will answer any questions you might, or almost any questions, let's put it this way. <laughs> but Kenneth, we're really grateful. Thank you for being with us today, and uh, we're, we're just so um, grateful. So let's start a little bit. Um, this this COVID-19 really took us all by surprise. In a recent interview you had with, the, with our regional um, newspaper here, the Tampa Bay Times, um, you went through how you first, when you first heard about COVID-19 and, and um, what happened in your company. So could you please, um, Kenneth, tell us and share with us how did it happen with you and with uh, with Feld Entertainment when you first heard about this COVID-19? So we have, um, back in March of uh, this past year, we had about 28 different tours all over the world. And probably I wanna say the first week of March, uh, very beginning, we were closed down in Singapore. Uh, because of COVID, and it had not, we hadn't heard a lot in the U.S. We knew it was happening, but you never think it's going to happen exactly where you are. And then literally on the 12th of March, we were in a st staff meeting, and we got a call uh, that we had a morning show of Jurassic World in Long Island, and the... Um, the head of the county, Nassau County, came on TV in a press conference and he closed everything down immediately. And from that point, that day, I think we had the remaining 25 shows that we had closed all over, all over the world. So we had to then figure what can we do? And we had equipment and people scattered everywhere from Indonesia, Europe, South America, uh, we had to bring these people back. And that's first and foremost, or bring them to their home countries. And then we had to figure out what equipment we wanted to bring back here to our headquarters in Florida and what equipment we wanted to leave in certain places around the world. And so it was a logistical nightmare. And that was maybe the easiest part about it. The next part was very difficult, which was we had over a thousand people, several thousand people, performers, crew, staff, that we, we were shut down. So we had no business and we had to make a decision and we had to make it quickly about what we were gonna do. And that began a series of layoffs and furloughs um, that was really heartbreaking because you then got to see the full impact of what COVID meant. And it wasn't just, it's terrible, the people that got sick, but the effect that it has had on all of us. And if it's one person and they have a spouse or they have children or they have mothers or fathers, then you see that it's not just two or 3,000 people of Feld Entertainment, it's 15,000 people that all of those people are touching. Wow, that's... that's uh, and, and throughout the, the, the 50 years, uh, uh, Kenneth, uh, the existing since the founding of Feld Entertainment, I'm sure we had our shares of, of uh, crises. So were there a crisis that did COVID-19 remind you of some of these crises? Were there some of the learning that you said, you know what, I remember doing this. How can we uh, leverage on this? Or this is so different from anything we've ever seen. I would say the previous 50 years was a good lesson, but the last thing any of us expected was that 
something could happen globally at the same time that would create this shutdown. And I think from my experience, one thing I knew, if you have a problem, don't just sit around and say, tomorrow will be a better day. Yeah. You have to deal with it. And we're fortunate because we have a great team of people and we had to get a plan and multiple plans in, in effect and do it quickly. Because the other thing that you have to think of, we're completely shut down. We didn't have one line of business that was wow. left open. And we know we have to do everything to try and preserve the company. So when we can reopen, we have the ability to bring people back and create all these jobs again. So to do that, we had to be very quick at what we did. We had to be definitive and we had to be humane in how we did it because there's nothing worse than that. And we have many people that have been with the company 20, 30, 35 years. So it, it was heartbreaking, oh, yeah. but it is, I've always had a philosophy in running the company and that is what is the best thing for the company? And that's what we tried to do. And by making these very difficult decisions about personnel, you do it because if you didn't do it, you probably wouldn't have a company in four or five months. Yeah. So we had to do it to preserve the company so we had the ability to bring everybody back, create all these shows again, and be back in business. I, I love these already great lessons learned, uh, uh, Kenneth, is you have to make the right decisions for the company, have a plan, start preparing when things get improved, and, and then you start business again. And, and for this, I'm so happy. I tell you, I was so excited to see Bell Entertainment is back in our, and, and back again. And congratulations, you! I think you just had two shows: the Monster uh, uh, Track and also Disney on Ice. I think in uh, Texas. So, can you tell us a little bit, uh, Kenneth? How did that go? How's doing entertainment in the new era, the new norm is? Well, we hope this is not the permanent new norm. But what we did is since March, since we were closed down, we've taken the seven months, not only to create one plan, but we've had multiple plans and multiple alternatives. But the things that were very constant was in order to be back in business and have our associates trust us and want to come back, we had to make them feel safe. Then to have an audience, we had to do whatever we could to make the audience feel safe. So we created a Feld Wellness Program, and it's on our website, and you can go and see a lot of the things that we're doing. And a lot of them are what we hear every day. But for our performers and our crew and our staff that were coming back to do these first shows, we actually... Uh, had a testing program and we were testing everybody twice a week. And then if you directly interface with the public three times a week, because what we found and what the science says is the more you test and if you can contact Trace, you can really contain the this COVID. And, we, you know, over time we may have positive cases, but if we can contain it and we know and everybody is responsible for themselves and for everyone else that they're traveling with, um, we won't probably have to shut down the entire show. On the other side, the consumer, we had to totally rethink capacity because everybody needed to be socially distant. So what we did, we, we went into all these different venues that we're planning to play. And what we realize is not just a circle with six feet radius, so everybody is that far apart. The width of every seat in these venues is different. And even within the venues, the seats are different widths. Then you have 
a different, what we call a rake. So it's an elevation to the rows. So you just can't do every other row because if it was a very steep rake, you're much closer than the six feet if you were two rows apart. So this was a whole system of algorithms working with our partners in the venues and our ticketing partners to create a blueprint of what the venue would look like. And typically it reduced our capacity by about 75%. So we're using 25% of our former capacity. Wow. I know Kenneth, one of the things that always hearing you talk and talking to you many times I'm fascinated by is, is you set the bar really high, the standard very high for yourself, for your executive team, for your uh, employees to give the best possible experience to the, to the uh, 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 clientele, to the customers. What is your assessment, at least based on these two first shows of that experience? Did it meet the high bar of Kenneth Fell? It really does, but you know, the reasons for everything. And this is a different experience because the, we had what was called pod seating. So it could be two seats up to eight or 10 seats that you would buy, your family would have, you would be together. So it's almost like a private showing for mm -hmm. your very close group. So the experience is more meaningful. I also think there's huge pent up demand for live entertainment and people have missed us <laughs> or live entertainment for the past eight months. So they're so appreciative and the comments that we're getting on social media from the people that attended is extraordinary. And it's, um, I know the performers, they go out there and even with 25% the number of people that we would normally be playing to, the response has been overwhelming. And a lot of it is, of course, our performers are the best and the show is the best, but it's also a memory that you have the first time you're out with your whole family, you can enjoy something. And if the first show was either Monster Jam or Disney on Ice, we're very happy because I guarantee you, people re will remember that first time they were out together after COVID for a long time, probably the rest of their lives. We're so ready for that, Kenneth. And uh, I think our wonderful producer, Dr. Jihan, is going to jump out of the screen to tell us that the, 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 uh, our, um, our uh, questions and the chat is really um, uh, out of the, of the roof in terms of questions. So um, let's take, a, if you don't mind, Kenneth, we'll take a question from the um, um, audience. Sure. So let's, uh, let's have the, uh, the first question from the audience. And you see it there, please. Keep your questions coming. So, uh, Kenneth, with most of your revenue coming from live touring, shows and events, what did you do during the shutdown to keep your company running and getting ready for the moment now where you can offer shows? Great question. That, that really is a good question. So what we did, of course, we couldn't have live performances, so we did plans. And one of the things that we didn't know we didn't know where COVID would be as a hotspot or maybe where it had subsided. So when we were routing to figure out where we could go to, to actually play, we booked a tour and for every city that we booked, we booked three other cities we put on hold for that same week. Uh, and we are very flexible and that's what we had to be so we knew we could always have one city turned into a hotspot. And most recently, we were supposed to be the end of this year in El Paso. And that's, that's had a lot of COVID. So we moved from El Paso to Hildago, Texas, where they don't have the same number of cases. So it's all about being flexible okay. and uh, being able to change the plans. And then what we did is we have a business which is uh, Monster Energy Supercross, which is uh, a 17 race motorcycle racing in stadium season. And we had completed half, a little more than half of the season. So we had seven races left. So we actually uh, 
went to the University of Utah and used the football stadium there, Rice Eccles Stadium, and completed our season with no guests in the seats. But we had all the races in, in a month, in the month of June. So we learned a lot there because everybody was being tested constantly. You couldn't come onto the compound if you weren't. And we were working with over, in total, over 900 people to do that. We had the races very successfully. They were all televised. All of our partners um, were very happy with the outcome. We had the highest television ratings that we've ever had on wow. NBC Sports. So it got more people into the sport, but that was a good lesson for us. We then had a television show with Monster Jam where we broke world records and we broke five Guinness Book of Records and it was a three hour show on the Discovery Channel. So these are things along the way that we would do to try and mitigate, try and keep our different brands alive in the hearts and minds of people uh, until we could actually come back. That's what a, what a great lesson here, uh, Kenneth. I always, when people ask me, said, you really need to rethink the way you do business, the way you deliver your product and services and, and, and be nimble. And that's exactly what you did. I think Jihan had a really good question uh, also from the audience there. Maybe Jihan about the, uh, uh, the economics of, of the whole situation. So if you can put it back, but I, yes, uh, I think the question is excellent. You know, um, live touring entertainment, that's how you get paid, right, mostly. Uh, that's how your revenues. But now you're operating at 25% um, of, of capacity. So how do you, if you don't mind, uh, Kenneth, share with us, how do you decide on, on the pricing structure and how do you make the math work? Well, in this case, it's very difficult. But we had another reason. We wanted to go out whenever we could. And we're going, you know, we had 28 shows. We now have one tour of Disney on Ice out there to really test the waters and to make sure that we could do it safely, again, for our team and then for the audiences. And we could make it a good experience. So we're learning constantly. And I, this, whenever we would go out the first time, it would be the first time. So let's do it now slowly. We crawl before we walk. And then when we walk and after that, we run like crazy. And <clears throat> that's what we're planning to do. And I think the other thing that we wanted to do was make sure that we could set the highest standard. Uh, because what we want is all of the other people that are in live entertainment, we want them to return as soon as they can. But we want everyone to have these high standards because I think it's the best thing for the public and that's the way our industry will come back. So it's much more important than just Feld Entertainment and a, and a few shows. It's really the entire live entertainment industry. Uh, uh, Kenneth, I, I, I'm going to uh, sidetrack here because I know many of our thousands of, uh, of viewers and listeners today are in, in family business. And always in my lectures and speeches, when I talk about a really well-run family business, I talk about felt entertainment. Can right. you give us one or two secrets of success? Why it's really working? And, and uh, you know, it's not easy. You're the father. You're the boss. You're, you have to make decisions. So how do you manage all of that to really give the best, possible experience for all of us and, and entertain us like nobody else does. It, it goes, you know, being in live entertainment, we're dealing with people. And our business is people. Our company is people. And I think that's the essence. And we want everybody to enjoy what they do. Whatever they do, their job is very important. And that you know, as they say, comes from the top. And we've always tried to take care of our associates, the performers, everybody as well as we could because we're not in business for one day. Uh, it's for now half a century uh, that I've been here. And 
every day is exciting, but we need to make sure that the people are motivated and happy because they are the touch point with the consumer. If our performers weren't happy, you're not going to have a great experience when you go there. They have to love what they're doing and make you love to watch them do that. And I think that's been the key to the success. And it, it is about people. And the other thing is, I always say, and I think I talked to a group of your students several yes. years ago. <laughs> yes. And you have to love what you do. And I think that's the most important thing. There's a lot of ways to make money, but you need the passion for what you're doing. And if you strive to be the best, then you'll figure out a way to make enough money. But what you'll have is a level of happiness that you won't get from anything else. Uh, so true. Uh, just to confirm what you said, Kenneth, um, a great person that we all know, we are the MUMA casual business and Les MUMA always uh, uh, tells people, he said, find something that you really enjoy doing and you will never work one day in your life. So this is exactly what you are saying. If you really enjoy what you're doing, you're passionate about it, you're, you, it doesn't feel like work. But, but I want to really go back and say, okay, so that's in general, but what about the family business, which is a different a, a layer of complexity, if you want, right? It's just complexity, pluses, minuses. You know, it's, it's different. There are plus and minuses and everything, but I will tell you, uh, for me, the fact that my daughters wanted to go to, you know, go to work with dad day is every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is you know is a compliment and i love it i enjoy it and you know i worked for my father it was um the greatest education i ever received and he was brilliant and hopefully i learned a lot from him and that i can transfer to my daughters and i think as long as they're happy and they have the passion for the business then it's a way to perpetuate it from more and more generations. That's uh, that's great. Let's take another question, uh, Dr. Jihan, from the uh, our friends from all over the world. Yeah, when do you think the live event industry will return to pre-pandemic status? That's a great question. <laughs> Everybody now is waiting for your answer. Okay. If I could give you that answer, yeah. then I would be world famous <laughs> unto myself. Uh, I honestly, I don't know. I We've spent the past eight months planning to return the way we could. But one of the things in that period that I learned, and a lot of times when you're running a business every day, you don't have the time to step back and think about the business. And we've had seven and a half months to do that. And one thing I know, anyone that was running a company pre-COVID that thinks they're coming back in the same way post COVID is not going to have a business. Yeah. And we've taken this time to rethink our operations, to become more efficient wherever we could, to take advantage of technology that we're using daily uh, now as a result of COVID, but we should maybe be using every day post COVID. And th things that, for instance, we would have a business manager on every one of our tours. Well, we found out with Zoom and all of these uh, like-minded um, virtual calls, we four people can do what 28 people did. And because it, it's more efficient and they're from one place and, and the technology, everything now is um, utilizing technology. And even for us to go out, and part of our business is the merchandise and concession business. And during this period, we created an entire touchless, contactless uh, point of sale uh, situation so that we take no cash now. It's all credit card. We never even touch your credit card. And we've also done some other things. You can pre-order or when you're standing in line or you're coming into the building, you can order from your seat 
and we prepackage it and we will then text you with the location where you can pick it up in the venue. So it's changed all of these things. And we were able during this seven months when we were just thinking to set up an entire concession operation in our in Feld Entertainment Studios. And so our people could understand how it would work, how we could work with the customer and how we could make it seamless. So there was a lot of good things that came out of it. So, and we're learning. And I think this was a time to become a learning company for everybody. And what can we do better? What can we do differently? And I think all of us will think about our customer quite differently uh, when they come back and we will realize how valuable they are. And I hope everybody in our industry treats them well and gives them more than their money's worth because that's going to make people want to come out again. And there is no substitute for that feeling of live entertainment. That is so true, uh, Kenneth. One of my favorite quotes that I've seen, it says, you know, people are always asking about the um, going back to the pre-COVID and the pre uh, the, the normal pre. He said, that's what really got us in trouble in the first place. That pre-normal, that pre-COVID, if it was not good, we would not be a mess now. So why do we want to go back to that uh, to that level? And, and, and you're really the essence of... Uh, of an organization of a company who did not let this crisis go to waste. You okay. leveraged, you rethought how you serve your customer, you thought about the, the, the health and well being of your associate, the health and well being of your uh, um, clientele and your clients, and how do you give them the best possible uh, experience. Um, I, so many things we need to talk about. We're, we're almost out of town, time here. So, so, um, Kenneth, if, to conclude, what, what kind of advice do you give to our listeners from your industry, you know, either tourism or hospitality and entertainment? That's what uh, we have thousands of people who are eager um, to have the success that you've had and, and have the wonderful experience going back uh, to business now. So if you have to summarize in two, three, one. I, I think, I think, one important thing is that we found out, because I don't think any of us could have imagined what we've been living through and will continue for a period of time, that we need to look deeper. We need to look at our faults and maybe as human beings, but as a company, where are you vulnerable? Because we know anything can happen now. And so, Shame on us if we don't learn from this. So it's, it's really learning from the past, living in the present, and always thinking of the future. And I think it, it's a way to not only in business, but, but for your life. Because people that get hung up in the past, they get stuck there. They never move forward. And so it's a great way to learn. And take everything that we do every day is a lesson for tomorrow. And I think, look, that's the key. And I think uh, we can manage the best way. Things are going to happen that we don't like, that we can't help, that are out of our control. But then take advantage of these situations to learn and then figure out what's in your control. How can you make that as perfect as you can? And then the other things you'll figure out how to live with. Kenneth, I, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I told you we're in for a treat today, and I hope you really felt it, saw it, and enjoyed it as much as I uh, did, probably even more. Kenneth, we're so grateful for you taking the time, despite the very busy schedule, but also opening up and really sharing your wisdom, your experiences, your advice to our uh, participants here from all over the world. You are making a difference, my friend. Thank you for everything you do to keep all of us entertained, but more importantly, what you do for your associate and what you do for our community. I think the Tampa Bay region is very, very lucky to have you as our neighbor here. And thank you so much for all you do. And I cannot wait to see you face to face very soon.
Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all the people that have registered to see this because I think it's a wonderful thing that you're doing uh, to you. get these people involved during this time. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Thank you, Dr. Jihan, and to the entire um, uh, faculty and staff who are participating in this wonderful, wonderful program. Um, stay tuned because you're going to see um, a great, great uh, session today, great module. And we always say, go Bulls. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Dean Moyes Dimayem. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, also, thanks to uh, Mr. Kenneth uh, Feld for this wonderful, lovely interview. As you have seen today, we started uh, pre-show interviews. Thanks to our Dean, Moma College of Business Dean Moyes Dimayem. He will be hosting guests uh, in the also following weeks as well. For those weeks that we are going to have pre-show, we are going to inform you and we will start uh, 30 minutes early, just like we did. We were a little bit late today, but we will try to start at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time. And our lecture always starts at five. And also please note that these pre-show interviews are not mandatory. You are welcome to attend. And they are also going to be recorded just like we are doing today. And most importantly, we got a lot of questions that they are not going to be part of the quiz. So the quiz still going to be part on the lecture, which is uh, we are going to start now. And I would like to remind you one more time, please keep tweeting our, your questions to us or write in the comment section and uh, also uh, the quiz will be available to you after the uh, today's lecture. And uh, so in the following weeks, we are going to have wonderful, wonderful speakers. Uh, Dean Moyes Limayem will be hosting them again, and we would love you to participate in those as well. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Faisal Ali to deliver his lecture. Dr. Ali, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Jehan, um, for uh, introducing me. But uh, I must also thank Mr. Kenneth and our wonderful Dean Moyes for this wonderful, wonderful interview. Now, it brings me into a very interesting position because Kenneth was so good in explaining about marketing and stuff like that. Uh, but lucky me, I have to talk about marketing. So there's always so much more to talk about marketing. And um, this is what we are going to do today. So. My name is Faizan Ali, and I'm an assistant professor uh, and graduate program coordinator at the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management, MoMA College of Business. Uh, in today's session, I want to keep it a little bit um, realistic. I'll, I'll share some of my own experiences as a consumer, as well as a marketing professor, because when I go out, I also see things from that prof prof professorial uh, viewpoint. So. Um, and that's why my uh, talk today is observations and thoughts about marketing during crisis. So um, feel free to uh, put your questions into the chat. And I've already asked Dr. Jehan to uh, you know, put the questions over the screen throughout the talk. And I'll be happy to take the questions and answer them. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, the elephant in the room. And that is 2020. So. Uh, how is your 2020 going so far? You you are more than welcome to put it into the chat window. Uh, for me, uh, it's okay, but it's not very okay because I like traveling and I haven't traveled for the last one year. So I just really think that 2020 is not doing very well. Um, I picked up this picture from Amazon. Uh, there was a company that was doing custom t-shirts and I liked it because they had this very interesting logo that people can put on their uh, t shirt So 2020 so far is not doing well. However, when I look at the things, uh, articles and stuff that people talk about 2020, in fact, Mr. Kenneth did talk about it as well. And anybody from the industry that we talk, uh, talk to about 2020 or coronavirus, there's something that everybody touches upon, and that is back to normal, or are we going back to normal? What is the normal? So that's, that's a big question. Are we going to go back to normal or are we going to define the new normal? What is it going to be, right? So the way I look at this new normal, I don't think that we are going to go back to the normal that was before COVID-19. And there are so many uh, examples for this. So think about one of the worst events that have happened of 9-11. So think about all the security that came after 9-11. 
now it's just the normal if you go through airports you see all these security and everything becomes the normal so um it it just becomes part of the normal and that's how we define the new normal and um, there's a funny picture i looked at it on internet and it just made me laugh so much because the more you travel in the us the more you see getting pretzels and a cup of coke uh, so so much for travel uh, stuff. So that's the new normal. So now when we look at this new normal in 2020 and things like this, of course, uh, when COVID-19 started, there were some interesting things that were observed. Th that was new. Nobody has ever seen it very new. So the way I look at it, I call it back in the day because I, I, the way I observed things in the last eight to 10 months, things have changed so much that when we Think about the starting two or three months of COVID-19, like December to March or April. It really, it really looks like ages ago. So I call it back in the day. Now, what happened right when the COVID-19 came with marketing? Uh, the first thing that changed a lot was the brand customer interaction. So all of a sudden, you see the interactions changed. And the reason was because many companies were not prepared for digital only. Then um, emergency, uh, social distancing, wearing masks providing hand sanitizers and things like this. So the brand consumer interaction changed quite a lot. The other thing that um, spiked a lot was unemployment. Now, of course, unemployment is not directly related to marketing, but it is because when people are unemployed, the way they look at their income and disposable income and their expenditures, they all change. So um, we had unemployment. That was a big thing. And companies had to deal with how to uh, provide services or products uh, that are dealing with this whole situation of unemployment. The third thing that was very interesting was um, um, supply chain issues. Now, I remember that IKEA, which normally, if you go to IKEA, you can find anything all the time, right? So IKEA was out of pretty much everything. I remember my son, um, he needed a school, um, a desk at home because it was all e-learning. I had to go to IKEA at least six or seven times, but I couldn't find desks. They were all out. Think about Best Buy. I remember when we moved to e-learning, uh, webcams were out, uh, keyboards were out, M mice, mouses that we use for our computers were all out. So definitely big issues with supply chain. And then one of the biggest things that happened was advertising setbacks. Now, what happens is normally big companies with bigger budgets, they have a lot of money and they plan their advertisement way in advance. So companies that already, um, uh, you know, they plan their advertising, they were sort of in a a uh, difficult position whether they want to go ahead with that advertising or whether they want to keep it you know um on 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 whatever the planned um timeline was one advertisement that i want to share here was very interesting this this came from um okay let me ask this in the chat again which brand do you think have suffered the most because of coronavirus and i'm going to take like five seconds because i want people to put it in the chat in your opinion which brand just a generic brand you think have suffered the most because of coronavirus all right so um i'll just give it a couple of minutes so the chat keeps coming um i want to keep it more like marketing related show so <laughs> i want more e word of mouth coming in all right so somebody said that i've never seen shelves so empty at walmart and that's very true especially if you were if you had to walk into um toilet paper or toilet roll section they were completely out or you know face masks or stuff like this so um you say airlines and cruise lines and amc and all of you are completely fine and i got the answer that i was looking for from brianna uh you are completely right so in my opinion the worst case scenario was for a beer brand called corona right and this is an advertisement that came with corona beer and they planned it way in advance but um, because coronavirus hit they delayed it for a month but then they thought of going ahead with that particular advertisement which i just want to put very soon onto the screen <laughs> Say hello to Corona Sunsets. Zero grams carbs, zero grams sugars, 90 calories. It's another way to find your beach. 
Now, um, it's interesting because some people might argue that there's nothing wrong with this ad, and it's truly nothing wrong with this ad. But the thing is, the way this ad is portrayed, where um, the ad is asking people to go on to the beaches and enjoy, and it's more like that spring because that was launched in uh, February. Um, that's what came uh, under fire on social media, where people were actually blaming brands like Corona Beer for these type of advertisements for pushing people to go out and avoid social distancing and things like this. Now, of course, if you ask me, my perception would be very different on all this issue, but you know, you cannot control this. This right now, the situation that we are in uh, with social media, once something goes out, it becomes viral, it's beyond anybody's control. So let's move ahead and look at how consumer behavior has changed, right? So we um, looked at some early days and then now going more into coronavirus time, what, ha what has changed in consumer behavior? So some generic trends that we have seen are um, based on the fact that not everything went bad. So I see in comments that many people are saying that, uh, you know, everybody suffered and we are still suffering. And that's completely true. I mean, I agree to this. But if you really look at it honestly, not every industry suffered. There are certain industries where they were overwhelmed with orders. Think about groceries because people are staying at home. They're consuming a lot of stuff. Uh, household goods, pharmacy general merchandise and the way I move forward, there's an interesting uh, industry here that is pet, pet supplies. And many people actually suffer with this because when I was talking to a couple of my friends about pet supplies, they asked me like, how come pet supplies increase, right? Um, so I'm just gonna leave it to all of you to, uh, you know, uh, comment on it uh, while I move further and then later we can talk about this as well. And the companies that really were all underwhelmed with orders were automotive, of course, because it's uh, an expensive purchase, furniture, luxury products, and then um, hospitality and tourism. So you see that many people do talk about hospitality and tourism in um, in the comment. And that's true that hospitality and tourism is one of those industries that have really, really suffered a lot. In fact, I want to um, point um, all of you towards one article that Dr. Jehan and I did for the conversation.com, where based on research, we predicted that the global hospitality and tourism industry is going to reduce by 50% by the end of coronavirus. So it's pretty um, difficult. Now, I see coming back to pet supplies that some people are talking, and that's very true because many people are staying home. They have to get pets to give them company or they are focusing more on their pets because they are home, right? So there's an increase in pet supplies as well. So these are some um, general trends. Now, of course, when uh, certain industries uh, get overwhelmed with orders, certain industries are underwhelmed with orders, it changes the shopping and general um, trends. So trends in general and trends in specific to certain industries. Now. Let's look at um, what do we see with those major trends around the world, uh, mainly with a focus on the US, but around the world because coronavirus has pretty much hit the entire world in the same way. Um, so the major trends are pretty interesting. Number one that we see is that people are now using a mix of digital touch points along their buying journey. So the whole buying journey becomes a little bit segregated where people are using multiple digital touch points. And those of you who have recently been to Target or Best Buy or any other major retailer, you would see that now people are using multiple digital touch points along their journey. Now, from marketing perspective, we are looking at um, a digital uh, journey into two major uh, segments, right? So one is where you discover, evaluate your products or your options or stuff like this. In this uh, particular section, there's a huge, huge increase in search engine, social media feeds and influencers. So you, uh, if you look at the numbers for Facebook or Instagram or uh, in fact, TikTok, right? TikTok is another upcoming social media channel uh, or platform. And if you see in the last one year, they have tripled their subscribers because people are subscribing to all these uh, social media platforms where they discover and evaluate the products or different alternatives. Now, the second part is buying part where people decide on something and then they buy it, right? In buying part, we see that um, one major, major, major thing that is coming up is mobile wallet. Now, interestingly, because when uh, I have, we have some friends from Asia in the chat, I see um, this pictures that you see on the top, the, this, this guy is a street beggar. 
and he has a QR code in his hand. Now, this picture is a couple of years old. This is not after coronavirus or COVID-19. This is like a few years ago. Um, so if you know and if you have any experience in China, you would see that pretty much everybody uses mobile wallet, like QR code everywhere, right? Now, in the US, it was a bit different, right? I've been using Apple Pay for quite some time, but honestly, it's surprising that major retailers, major hospitality companies do not um, they were not having any type of infrastructure for mobile payments a, a bit earlier, like a, a year earlier or two years early. There was nothing like that. Um, now you, we suddenly see there's a huge surge into contactless payment and stuff like this. In fact, PayPal have started the QR code payment. And if you go to any major retailer now, like um, I don't know about Walmart, but Publix, Target, they've started these contactless payments. My own banks have canceled my older credit cards and uh, debit cards, and they've sent me the new cards with contactless payment and stuff like this. So you, we see this as a major trend coming ahead. Now, um, going further, the second trend that we see it's coming up is omnichannel. Now, most of you may have heard of omnichannel. This is where where companies come into um, the whole consumer journey and they put multiple touch points, but these touch points are supposed to be very seamless to provide a better experience to uh, customers. Now, this is a very new thing. I mean, normally in theory, it's not a very new thing. It's same like uh, augmented reality or virtual reality, where for the last five years, every year, one tech company says that it's the next big thing and then nothing happens. So omni-channel is somewhat the same. Uh, we, are, we are talking about this for a long time. We are hearing about it for a long time. But when you look at the application of it, it's not so good. In fact, I'm just going to share two very interesting observations of mine about omni-channel. So Target um, has a good, I mean, they are moving towards omni-channel. And if anybody have been to Target recently, you would see that they have a lot of uh, um, deals and stuff in the store. So, you know, if you go to different aisles, you see different type of posters that say you can get a $10 off, $20 off or something like this. But you don't get it unless you download the app. So you have to download an app, a Target app. You scan that deal in the app, add it. And then when you go to check out, then you can buy things in the store. And then you have to scan the app again through the uh, POS system so that that deal can be given to you. Now, for, for me as a consumer, it's a lot of different steps. Normally, Omnichannel is supposed to make it seamless, but it's a bit more of a hectic journey for me as a consumer. Um, another example is for Best Buy. I recently ordered um, AirPods Pro from Best Buy app because they had some, some deal going on. I got the AirPods Pro. There were no ear tips in, in the airport pro. So I call the customer service. They ask me to take it to the store and replace it. I went to the store. In the store, they told me they cannot replace it because I bought it through the app. So I have to return it through the app. I was a bit surprised because the app is for Best Buy, right? And then they told me, no, what you can do is this. You can return it to the store. We won't return and replace for you. We will give you a gift card, and then with that gift card, you buy another airport in the store. So to me, it's again like multiple hurdles coming within that omni channel, right? So if we think about them, um, obviously this is a good good technology to make it seamless, better experience, contactless, and everything. But it is just so so new. In fact, some recent research on omni channel says that consumers feel that they are communicating with separate departments and not one company. And my own experience is the same, right? So uh, that's another one. Now, the third major trend that we see is digital sale. Digital sale is getting much, much higher. Now, when I say much higher, it's really, really much higher. So when we look at digital sales, uh, one thing that's important, I just talked about uh, Best Buy. I also talked about Target, and there are several other cases. Now, of course, to their defense, uh, these companies did not have a lot of time to pivot, right? To move on to digital sales. It was very quick. You have to move very quick. So it's understandable for all these hurdles and hoops. Uh, but, you know, as researchers, it's our job to bring it further and then, you know, the industry folks to work upon them. So for digital sales, what we see is that um, it has grown uh, a few folds, right? So digital sales, according to this Deloitte report, in 2020 quadrant one, 
the growth was 18% compared to the quadrant one in 2019. So we see a 18% growth. Then for Amazon, there was a 13% growth in Q1 in 2020 compared to 2019. Now, recent reports, which I saw early today, is saying that uh, since May to July 2020, Amazon's growth, uh, consumer spending on Amazon has increased by 60% compared to last year. And that's why you see Jeff Bezos recently becoming the wealthiest man on the earth, right? So you can see that um, coming to fruition. Now, um, Interestingly, for digital sales, there are a couple of other very interesting trends that um, gives us a lot to look into as marketers. One is that in quadrant one 2019, desktop traffic declined by 9%. And we all know that these days, many people are using smartphones for doing things, right? So in 2019, desktop traffic for online purchasing uh, declined by 9%. But in Q1 in 2020, it increased by 9%, which means that um, it's 18% growth, right? Which so that's desktop traffic. And then for traffic coming from social media, again, um, has increased 2% from 6% to 8%. So what it means simply is that now people are using desktops to buy things, but they are not coming directly to website. They're basically being directed from social media feeds into that. And um, you can see what I said earlier, that social media, social media influencers are an emerging trend. So these influencers, social media platforms are pushing people to go on Amazon. Right now, Amazon's affiliate marketing program is one of the best affiliate marketing programs because people are pushing others to go on Amazon and buy things. So this is the third major trend that we look into digital marketing. Now, of course, when the supply side changes, the demand side also changes. We also see some changes in consumer um, trends. What do we see there? Very interesting. So people are staying at home. They are spending time on different things. So when we look, where do people spend their time? So there's significantly more people are spending time on entertainment, TV, movies, games. So just imagine how much of uh, how many of you are using Netflix now or Amazon Prime or Disney Plus or stuff like this, right? Or online games. Then people are watching and reading news, which is understandable due to coronavirus and awareness and stuff like this. And many people are significantly spending more time on their hobbies. Moderately more time is being spent on cooking, social media, household chores, shopping online, and physical fitness. Now, when I say physical fitness, it's basically online fitness classes and stuff like this. Why is it important to look at this? Because in my opinion, this is bringing to us new segments in the market. So when we say that people are being lost, it's not that. It's just that older segments are disappearing and newer segments are emerging. Uh, how long will it sustain? We don't know, but we can predict that it's going to stay for a long time. Now, general consumer behavior changes due to all this digital sales and due to all these um, online sales and you know spending time and all these things. What's happening with people in general? So one is more and more people are staying at home. Right. When people at stay at home, they also consider their role of their home in their daily lives. Right. Like, for example, I am teaching from home, but it's not very easy. It's not like I go and turn on the computer. I start teaching before I teach. I also need to figure out is my uh, are my kids very noisy because they are at home. And also, is my washing machine making more noise that can disturb my online meetings? how to change the daily chores in a way that do not interfere with my kids' education as well as my meetings because we have those overlapping with each other. So that's a big change and people are changing their product or service selection based on the impact of how much that product or service is changing the new normal for them. The second thing is nostalgia. So right now, honestly, um, in the chat, tell me how many of you are actually really, really hungry to travel. Right. Just a simple travel because it's nostalgic. Right. So we human beings are in that situation where when we are deprived of a need that we are so used to after a while, you just feel nostalgic. You really want to consume it. Right. You know, very recently, um, um, Nintendo launched their uh, vintage game console because people want it. People are staying at home. They are playing games, but they want vintage games just for that nostalgic feel. Right. There are so many new products coming that are very, very nostalgic for people. And the third thing that is majorly changing things is self-reliance. Um, DIY things are increasing. 
Uh, Publix is doing pretty well with half cooked uh, meals where people can take that half cooked cook meal, go home and cook it. Um, there are so many other companies that are coming with um, uh, prep meals, right? So you can get them. It's not 100% cooked. You can use it, um, use some time at home and cook it at home. So we are seeing new products coming out of these three major consumer behavior changes. Now, coming to technology. So this is something very interesting for all of you. And um, I just want to tell you this. Um, that since coronavirus, um, and I've, I, I was listening to one keynote speech by Microsoft, a uh, keynote uh, conference by Microsoft, where they said that right now, coronavirus is actually the next big engine for transformation, and we are already seeing it. So if you really look at um, online delivery, right? So if you look at online delivery, um, what has been done in eight weeks uh, during May to July, like I said, this is equivalent to what was done in 10 years. So the amount of online sales in the last 10 years is equivalent to what happened in the last eight weeks. Um, unbelievable, right? Uh, think about remote learning. Uh, I mean, uh, my students are learning remotely, my kids are learning remotely, and pretty much everybody that I know around the world is doing it remotely. What was the push for it? So imagine 250 million students in China went online for remote learning in two weeks. Two weeks, 250 million students. Imagine the infrastructure it requires, the bandwidth it requires, the hardware, the software it requires. And that's why you can see a huge bump in Zoom, a huge bump in StreamYard, and all the platforms like this that are used for streaming and virtual, um, virtual platforms for learning and stuff. Look at online entertainment. Can anybody guess how successful is Disney Plus right now? So Disney Plus, in terms of subscribers and in terms of watch time, has achieved uh, in two months what took Netflix seven years to achieve. So whatever Netflix did in seven years, Disney Plus has done it in two months. So you can imagine the scale of the transformation that is happening with online learning, uh, virtual platforms and things like this. And it's a huge, a huge trend that we are looking at in terms of marketing as well. How is it changing people? We see more people looking into curbside, online ordering, contact-free delivery, but it also brings security issues. So Pizza Hut recently launched a new temper safe label. So when you order, they put this sticker, temper-free sticker on the box so that you know that nobody touched your pizza. Um, after it was um, you know, sent out from the shop to your, to your home or to your door. And then we also see technology coming here, contact-free delivery or contact-free service. QR codes are becoming very popular in restaurants for ordering. So you don't have to touch the menus, rather you can use QR codes to do that. Now, moving along, this is an interesting thing for all of you to look at. And this is how much optimism changes your intentions to spend. So I see that normally when you look at the, the chat, we see that most of the people are very optimistic, yet very worried. Many people are thinking, is it going to be same? How quick are we going to go out of it? So the less optimistic you are, the less you intend to spend on big things. And you can see that most of the countries in Europe uh, or US, Canada, these are less optimistic about COVID-19, um, about post-COVID-19, economy recovery, and they are less inclined to change. In fact, if you look at US, people are thinking to spend 30% less. Canada is around 40, 35, 38% less spending in the next year or so. So this is what we have right now as a consumer behavior trend that we are looking at. Moving along, role of social media. So now, because we talk about digital marketing and all these different things, um, let's look at social media, because this is one of the major, major things in digital marketing. But um, before I go into that, let me see if there are any questions that I can quickly answer uh, along the way. So um, <laughs> this is not a question, but it's a good comment. Curbside, um, uh, curbside ordering is an uh, introvert's dream. So honestly, I, I, I believe in that as well. But that's the new reality we are living in as well. So we have a question uh, from Anudari. Do you think marketing will change forever after COVID-19? Of course, I, I'm not in a position to say if it's going to change forever, right? Because uh, we need to look at the next five years, the next 10 years. What I know for sure is that people are not going to come back 
to pre-COVID-19 situation. Even as consumers, when you are once you are used to all this stuff, you're not going to go back. I see many people that they were very allergic to technology pre-COVID-19 now doing using it pretty well. And they, they understand that it's very useful to be efficient and effective. So we cannot assume that after COVID-19 is gone, they're going to go back to old ways, right? So consumers are going to understand the benefits of all this. In fact, right now I see that many people um, really like their time with their families. Many people like the, the connections with their close family and relatives and things like this. So people, I don't think are gonna go back. And because consumers are not gonna go back, companies also are not going to go back. It's always going to you know move further. All right, um, do, you, do you not think that there's a cultural aspect to, um, being optimistic or pessimistic, I certainly think, and I think if you look at many countries in that uh, graph that I had for optimism and pessimism, you would see that many of these countries, um, other than a few, few, uh, a few exceptions, most of them are countries that are pretty high on individualistic tendencies. And if you look at the countries that are high, uh, more optimistic, you will see that they are more collectivist countries, like look at China, Brazil, Portugal, um, Nigeria, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia. So you see these countries are more collectivist, bigger families and things like this. So of course you see more optimism there versus other countries that are um, a little bit more pessimistic. So uh, that's what I think. Now, social media. Social media, interesting, right? So some people love it, some people hate it. It's just a polarizing subject, but it's the reality. We cannot do anything with it because it's the reality and uh, it's the world that we are in. Now, this chart is interesting. It shows us a lot of stuff about what happens on uh, social media in one minute. So imagine in one minute, uh, what happens on social media on YouTube, 4.5 million minutes of video is watched in one minute on YouTube. Now, just uh, for one moment, imagine the scale of it. Why is it that there are so many YouTube ads on YouTube videos that you watch? Because it's a platform that people watch. And um, advertisers need those platforms where all the eyes are, right? So this is what we have. Um, look at Instagram, right? So 347,000 swipes or scrolls on Instagram in one minute. Unbelievable, right? And then you look at Amazon, you look at um, Snapseed and all this stuff. But what's very interesting to me is Tinder. 1.4 million swipes on Tinder in one minute, right? So you see that there's business opportunity there, right? For uh, <laughs> couple matching and something like this. So this is the reality that we are living in, right? Now, moving along with social media, let me ask all of you. So those of you who use social media, what do you think? Do you think social media is a friend for us or is it not so much of a friend. Whoa. What is it that you think? While I um, wait for some answers on this one, uh, Dr. Jehan, is there any questions that I can answer um, while a couple of um, seconds I wait for some answers on this question? Okay, so which other department besides marketing will help bring consumers back to the hospitality industry in the near future? I, you know, honestly, this, this is a very interesting question. I think that marketing is integral because smart marketing people do not bring people back. They just make people feel that they need to do it. So it's not bringing back, it's creating new needs and new wants, right? So at the forefront, I feel it's always marketing. Now, what's important for all of us to know is that on the back end, all the other departments, whether it's human resources, whether it's supply chain, whether it's you know um, strategic management people, corporate people, they all have to keep up the promises or the things, expectations that the marketing develop. That's very important. So I think all the departments are integral, but marketing is just at the forefront to create that need and that want for people. I see that um, for many people, you say both social media is frenemy, it's pretty cool, right? So this is good. For me, social media works for me a lot because I, yeah, yeah, the social dilemma is unbelievable. Very good documentary. I think everybody should watch it. It's a very good documentary. And in fact, I'm thinking to use it in my classes as an assignment. So um, it's good to know both the sides. Now, social media, normally it's, it's pretty good. I think that it helped people in terms of awareness with COVID-19 and everything. So it really did help. 
But at the same time, it also created some negativity. In fact, I want to share a couple of very sad stories. This lady here owns a re owned a restaurant in Canada. And um, just because somebody spread a fake news about her on Chinese social media in Canada, saying that she employed some people who were COVID positive, uh, her business went down and she had to close her restaurant, right? So it's a sad story to think about it. Another one which is very sad is also about um, Canada, where um, several parents of kids uh, ask the school authorities to remove the kids with Asian parents um, so that their kids are less prone to COVID-19. So just something like this, when you look at it, it's just so, so difficult to comprehend because social media can just make things viral without any um, uh, you know, substantiated claims or something like that. In fact, WHO released a very interesting report saying that WHO is fighting um, not only the pandemic, but also the infodemic because social media is just so much out of control. So this is just a food for thought for all of us to think about the role of social media and everything. Now, let me share this with you. So because we talk about social media, right? So um, it doesn't matter how much people claim for social media being a science where you can understand the process or whatever. I think it's a bit difficult because um, it's not one segment that we are targeting on social media. Social media is all types of people and some people like things, some people don't, right? So um, if you look at this most liked picture on Instagram, I mean, normally if I ask you, what do you think is the most liked picture on Instagram? It's very difficult to answer this because people might think a lot of different things. But the most liked picture on Instagram is this one. This is interesting. It's just an egg, nothing special. It's not a golden egg. It's not an egg that was hatched and something interesting came out of it. Nothing like this. It's just an egg. And what happened was um, just one guy posted a picture, said, like, can we make this egg as the most like egg on Instagram? And it became in three weeks, it got 54 million likes. Now, it, you know, you can do a research on why did this egg become famous? Nobody knows, right? I mean, it's just difficult to comprehend why social media reacts to certain things in a different way, right? Um, now, importantly, um, regardless of um, the egg, um, for businesses, what's important is that whenever you work with social media, remember that you should have an objective. Like anything that is posted on social media should go with a particular objective. It should be inspiring. Inspiring means it should have a call for action. People should do something, right? And these actions can be, you can educate people about your products, your services, what you are doing. You can engage them so that they can become your advocates or they can become marketing for you. Or you can convert them from maybe a non-consumer to a consumer by providing inspiring social media posts and things. Now, when we look at social media, Pretty much everybody does it these days, right? So everybody does it. The question is, are we doing it right? Is it the right way of doing social media, right? And what is the right way? So basically when we are on social media, we are targeting the people on social media. So it's important for us to listen to them. What are those people saying? What is it that they want? before we go ahead and use social media. That's important, right? So for that, we have something called social media analytics. Um, why do we do it? There are so many different benefits of it, right? And for small businesses, there are several platforms where they can do it. Big businesses, of course, already do things like this, right? So it can help us with identifying trends, what's happening, what's new. It can also help us understanding sentiments of people. What do people think about at this time? New opportunities, it can help us predict crisis, before it actually hit us. Now, of course, not something like COVID-19 because, and, and you know, honestly, I think it can also predict something like COVID-19 because I remember very clearly when in China, this thing came in December, it was actually around March or April where it got worse in the US. And I know that when it hit China at that time, many people on social media uh, who are Chinese or from Chinese origin, they were talking about it, but people in the US or other countries just didn't take it too seriously, right? They didn't listen to what was happening on social media. So um, that is something very interesting for us as well. And then ultimately benchmarking, you can benchmark yourself with your previous performance or with your competitors or stuff like this. One tool that is important for um, all of you who are planning to use um, social media analytics is social listening listening to people, what are they talking about, right? So um, looking at the tweets, 
looking at hashtags, looking at tags, right? What are people basically talking about? Um, who is your audience? What do they want? And stuff like this. And some platforms give you something like this. This one is net based. So you can see that um, the green ones, uh, the, the first one here, the graph shows uh, the frequency of tweets about certain event. And then you can see the green one shows the positive sentiment, the positive tweets, the red one shows negative. You can also see keywords that people are using. So every time after an incident, you would see that all of these tweets change. In fact, United, when um, two years ago, when they kicked out that one doctor, Vietnamese doctor from United uh, Airline by punching him in the face, after that, uh, United's entire social media uh, feed went red because people were just having negative sentiment towards it. Um, and then there are some other things that you can also do with uh, with these tweets and Twitter and stuff like this. Now, normally this picture is just an example. If you look at this guy with a very good physique and bodybuilder and, you know, and then he is holding a pizza in his hand. So normally when you look at it, it seems contradicting. Like how can this guy have this physique with low fat and eating pizza, right? I mean, it just is a bit contradicting. But at the same time, you can see that thousands of people have liked this photo. Now, of course, some people like the photo because of the guy. Some people like the photo because of the pizza. But there may be a big segment of people who like the photo because of the pizza with this guy, right? So you have a new segment of people who you can target by offering a new product that is low fat, but that can, I mean, you can eat pizza with low fat and also keep your physique and something like this. So these type of tools can help with coming up with new offerings, new products, looking at what's happening on social media. At the same time, we have um, some interesting facts. So this is one research that I want to share with you. This was one of our research that we did at USF uh, about social segments. So you also see that segments being developed um, based on sentiments, how people react to certain things happening, right? So um, this one is about an airline. I obviously removed the name of the airline, but it shows that there were some positive tweets, some negative tweets tweets. And if you look at this 1st July and 8th July, between that, suddenly the frequency goes high, right? And if you look at that time during the tweets, you have these words like delay, cancel, emergency landing, and safe, safe flight. So you can assume that what happened at that time, maybe around July 3rd or 4th, the flight had to do an emergency landing. And then they had to stay on the runway because um, and it created some delay. So some people were not happy, but some people were happy saying that it was a safe thing to do or something like this, right? So you can see these type of things on social media. My research was something similar. So what we did was you may have seen some of these logos on social media for some big brands. They were changing their logos to promote social distancing, right? So you see McDonald's changed it, Volkswagen changed it. Coca-Cola changed it, Audi, all these brands. So what we did was we did a survey with 1,140 people in the US to see how do they think about these brands. Very interesting. So normally what you would think is that the brand is doing something good to promote social distancing, right? But we saw that there were people who were clearly in favor of social distancing and there were people who were clearly against social distancing in general, not about brands in general, right? And you can see them all everywhere, right? These days when you look at... Um, different political rallies, you would see some people say, this, this is this is not good, right? Social distancing. And what they did is they, they bring all of that uh, uh, perceptions of normal social distancing applied to brand. So people who do not like social distancing in general started hating the brand for doing it. So you can clearly see something like this, right? So sometimes as marketers, it's important to look at things like this because many times, Things that have nothing to do with branding can impact your branding, right? So social distancing normally has nothing to do with branding, but people's attitude towards social distancing changes um, this one. And we have several examples of this Chick-fil-A who were clearly against um, same-sex uh, couple marriages. Uh, people say negative stuff about them or Nike. Uh, promoting that athlete who for who did not kneel down for the national anthem, you know. So you can see people having these different reactions to general issues, bringing them to brands as well. So social segments. Now, normally in the crisis, many brands go dark. They don't say anything. They don't take positive side, negative side. Just go dark. Now, as per the research, if you deal with social media 
uh, with the crisis on social media means if as a brand you take a side it actually increases shareholder value companies um, that have responded well to the different type of crisis on social media have seen a 20 percent increase in value on average and companies who did not respond or respond poorly to crisis have seen a 30 percent decrease in value so what we see normally is that um, uh, you, to to achieve that state of nirvana right that the the, the the perfect state it is a mix of analytics and creativity so you cannot just go with analytics you have to be creative about it and how can you do that i will share some stuff with you before i do that i will very quickly share with you another research that we did for m3 center with around 2000 adults in the us and this was a simple survey asking people about what do they think should be responsibilities of hospitality brands during this time. And we have some very interesting insights. So people, uh, what they expect of brands is this. Number one, hospitality brands should be positive contributors to society and reconnect with their customers. Use their resources to help people, bring people together and raise awareness about COVID-19. Unite people from different backgrounds and act as leaders. Develop people's trust and respond to their post. Now, of course, these answers that you see, especially the first three points, or maybe point number one and point number three, it might also be because of the confounding effect of elections, because there were elections happening, people were talking about social issues and this and that. So maybe because of that, um, the respondents also talk about how brands should do this. Nevertheless, this is an important thing to know for businesses that you have to listen to your customers. What do they think of? And then what can you do? So one, if you are on social media, make sure you share only important details and to the point. Don't go too much. Don't go all out. It just is going to, um, you know, um, it's not positive for people. And the reason for that is because pre-COVID-19, people were going to their phones as a skip. You know, so you work on your computer, you're very tired, and then you pick up your phone, you start scrolling down and look at social media. Now, you are on your phone, you are on your computer all the time. So it's not an escape going to social media, it's just the normal thing. So the more details you provide, the less um, effectiveness it, it bears, right? So make sure that there's not too much um, details, just important updates and to the point. The second thing is find ways to help. This is very important because right now, many people who are jobless, who are working at home, many people who are not even jobless, like, okay, maybe they are not jobless, but because everybody is at home, they just need more help, right? So people need brands that can find ways to help them. This company, um, Anushar Bush, very interesting. They used all their resources to create hand sanitizers, right? So it just provides a positive image of the brand in the consumers. Another company I would like to talk about is Nike. So Nike normally, um, they have converted a horror story into a good story. And what happened was very interesting. So they reported $790 million quarterly loss in 2020. And their revenue was $1 billion short of what Wall Street predicted for 2020. Okay, horror story, $1 billion short revenue. But what they did was they came ahead, they launched a Nike training app, okay? On Nike.com, they have some famous athletes who are doing one-to-one -one or one-to-many, um, you know, training sessions. And then they were also very active on Nike YouTube channel. Now, what happened with all of this was that this they've seen a 75% increase in their digital sales. Now, what does it mean for Nike? So from 20, 2009, to 2019. So 2009, the e-commerce penetration for Nike was 5%, like 5% digital channel sale. 2019, it, it's 15%, so 10% increase in 10 years. Guess in three months of 2020, where did the e-commerce um, um, channel went up? From 15% to 38%. So what it took Nike 10 years in digital sales in just three months, it doubled it because of these uh, things, finding ways to help providing more digital options for consumers. And then this ad, I don't know if uh, some of you have seen it or not, but this was a couple of years ago, Pepsi came up with this ad for um, Pepsi and the way they portrayed this ad was also about Black Lives Matter or social issues, right? But very interestingly, 
what happened was after this uh, ad was launched, uh, Dr. Martha Luther King's daughter, she took us um, took to this app and this ad and she tweeted, if only daddy would have known about the power of Pepsi, right? Which actually just is so bad for the brand, right? If you think about it. So make sure that you use compassionate messaging, use your best judgment, do not do trend ja jacking. Now, it's a good idea to use trends, but use it compassionately, not to make profits, right? Because consumers can judge. And then the other thing is, remember, coronavirus is here. And you cannot hide it, right? It's here. It's it's right with us. So make sure you embrace it and reach out to your customers. Don't go dark. Reach out to your customers. Tell them what's going on. And then don't go redundant with your information. Be creative. Because uh, there's a video I don't want to share now because it's like four minutes long video. But um, I, when um, Dr. Jehan sends an email, I'll ask him to add that link into that email. You can watch if you are interested. But major brands, uh, if you look at their advertisements for coronavirus, they are 99% same. You would just feel that they've changed the name of the company. The rest of the advertisement is same. Don't do that. Be very creative with your advertisement. In the start, I showed you Corona Beer's advertisement. Now I'm going to show you another beer company's advertisement on how they have used coronavirus to create an advertisement. And then we will be um, done with this um, session. The hot shakes, the high five, the fist bumps, the flirt eyes, the team breaks, dab greetings, thumb wrestling, chick pinching, high kisses, bite kisses, air kisses, French kisses, back slaps, the love taps, the happy claps, the hugging. The piggybacks, the holding, the bear hugs, the strolling, the squeezing, the hand in hand, the eye to eye, holding closely, the hugging goodbye. With a million ways of being together, now it's staying apart that brings us closer than ever. Good to see you. Um, are remember that um, unlike other crises, COVID-19 has actually created a need for marketers. People need marketers because earlier we talked about it. There's new market segments. People are just um, feeling the need for nostalgia or stuff like this. So there's a need for marketers. Um, and then remember the internet use has, has gone up from by 50 to 70 percent so you have new people joining the internet right so new people coming to online channels or digital channels and then right now your focus as a brand should be more on engaging people rather than selling because the more engaged they are they are ultimately going to buy from you but the focus should be more on engaging rather than selling uh, do not forget to anthropomorphize your brands or services. Give them human elements. Um, uh, some of you may know Hotel.com. They have a very interesting mascot, this guy with a red jacket, and he is running around here and there. And then during social distancing, they just change that mascot sitting alone um, using hand sanitizer. So just make sure that you anthropomorphize your brands and services so that people can associate their feelings and emotions with the brands. Um, Make sure that additional value is provided to consumer, mainly education related. Many, many people have seen a good increase in their uh, sales only by providing more educational related stuff. Planet Fitness has started free fitness classes and they have seen an increase in their subscribers because people want to join them, right? So stuff like this. Um, right now we have new market segments like gamers and at this moment bigger companies are thinking of investing more advertising budget into gaming industry because many people are playing games now and then make sure that uh, focus on your data make sure that your data is there from social media and you should leverage that data to provide a better experience mainly remote experiences because right now we are still in the state of emergency so with this, I am going to stop. And if there are any questions, we can take some questions right now. Thank you. OK. Um, 
All right, so the question is from Twitter. Uh, how permanent can virtual experiences be in tourism? I think um, they will be permanent, not for all the people though, for certain people. So you still have a lot of people who would like to go places, but they want to keep themselves safe. So you will see virtual experiences. Now, when we say virtual experiences, I see many people freak out saying, no, 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 travel can never be virtual. But imagine that, let's say you want to do a destination wedding. Right? You don't have to go to that destination twice, one to see the destination and then to go and have your wedding there. You can do the virtual experience before your wedding to see how that destination is and then you can go and do it. Right, So it's going to save you money and stuff. So like I said, there are new market segments being emerged. For brands, it's important to understand those segments and provide the appropriate products rather than experimenting with them. Any other questions? Thank you. That was a comment. Thank you very much. All right. So, um, OK, uh, are there any brands industry who are able to overcome the pandemic? Um, OK, so this is interesting. I think, honestly, um, uh, some smart restaurants have overcome the pandemic. Yeah, while some restaurants have closed down, you see other restaurants have focused more on um, the trends of consumer behavior. I've seen several restaurants that did not have curbside pickup or delivery. They've started doing it, right? Um, and then at the same time, there are several restaurants that are moving into very innovative ways of delivering food. In fact, uh, Dr. Jehan and I recently went to one of the restaurants in our area, which is an Indian restaurant called Tandoor. They came up with a very interesting idea. So they normally have buffet lunch, but I mean, who is going to do buffet lunch right now in social distancing? So what they did was they brought a very authentic tool called thali, which is an Indian dish of where you have a central place in your plate and then smaller plates so you can take it, take it away, eat it somewhere. So um, some companies have overcome it with very unique products and services, uh, not a complete extent though. I don't think any companies have completely overcome other than tech companies. So tech companies are doing very well right now. Um, all right. Um, yes. Um, okay. So uh, I will. Uh, is there any other questions, Dr. Jehan? Okay. So uh, Laura, you bring an extremely, extremely good point. Hotel marketing. Do you skip addressing safety and just sell experience? Um, no. Uh, you cannot. Actually, when we talk about experience, experience in itself is a very, very complicated uh, area. I mean, you cannot just say that this is an experience, right? There's so much more that goes into experience. And um, right now, I know that several um, online travel agents have started their own rating system based on the safety and cleanliness, where the hotels are provided star ratings based on how clean they are or how safe they are. So when we say experience, actually safety, security, cleanliness are integral parts of experience. So when you sell it, you, of course, have to tell people that this is what we are doing. Right now, I know that some hotels, uh, what they are doing is that uh, they are coming up with new products like work from hotel instead of stay at hotel where people can go and work from hotel with social distancing, with safety, with security and proper CDC guidelines. At this moment, I don't think any hotels or any businesses are going beyond what is required by CDC or any other authorities because the more you do it, the more you are increasing the cost. And that increased cost has to come out of increased pricing, which is not a good strategy at this time. So that would be my answer. All right, is there a way to make a brand your friend without anthropomorphizing them? <laughs> well, uh, I think the, the best answer to this, Rick, um, in, in a humorous way would be, would you like to friend a robot if that looks like maybe a robotic vacuum cleaner? Probably not. People feel much friendlier when you have a robot that look like a human being, right? It's much less uh, uh, intrusive. It's, it's much less intimidating. So I think anthropomorphizing doesn't mean that you have to bring a human mascot to it or whatever. It just means if you are on time, if you are responding quick, if you are showing some compassion to your customers, that's human attribute, right? So any human attribute, whether it's physical or emotional, the more they come to the brand, the more people find value to them. 
Yes, uh, live events, including some part of it as virtual experience. Yes, it's a very good question from um, Muma College of Business. I'm, I'm sure it comes from Twitter. So I um, think that it's already happening right now. In fact, um, one major sports entertainment company called WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment, they have completely and they actually have had built from scratch a virtual experience scape for people called Thunderdome, where you can actually join the live events via some platform like Zoom, right? So if anybody have used Zoom and if you have like 40 people, you see all these small, small thumbnails. So they have actually um, uh, put 7,200 LED boards around the ring where the wrestlers are fighting. So all those people join into those live events virtually at this moment. Uh, would this be um, a big thing in the future? I think there's a good model of uh, where you can bring um, real people, charge them pretty high as premium pricing, so they can feel less, um, more safe um, in, in the arena live, while people like economy ticket buyers or things like this, they can join in virtually with a much lesser price, right? So there are several models that we can see coming across um, in the future. Uh, okay, we did a scavenger hunt on our website when quarantine started. As you go. Yeah, it's very good. I actually have seen that several um, academic conferences are doing the scavenger hunts on Zoom because it's just so tiring sitting in front of the computer all the time, right? So, um, yes, I completely agree. Aliza, work from hotel is a big, big marketing push right now. In fact, Marriott recently announced that they are going to transform some of their um, brands into work from hotel thing. So yeah, we, we see this. Okay. Um, all right. Any other questions? Or, all right. Do you think that co-working companies will do well now? Um, you know, yes um, and no. I mean, it depends on which industry are we talking about. So if you are talking about hospitality industry, yes, several uh, co-working companies that can provide uh, co-working platforms for hospitality industry, people who work on the back end can work. But you know, hospitality is mainly about person-to-person uh, -person interaction or something like this. I don't see co-working companies doing very well in regard to hospitality industry. I think um, uh, this is a very good question. Um, again, uh, because I've provided several examples from retail, so I'll take it because uh, it's not directly hospitality, right? But I love it because I see that there's a huge surge in Home Depot and Lowe's. Uh, if you go to Home Depot and Lowe's right now, I mean, these days, it's just crazy because everybody is there. Um, people are staying at home. They need uh, things to do to you know, cut their time and whatever. So I, I definitely think that there's a big, big boost in that industry. Okay. All right. Um, it was really, really fun. I think I, I normally enjoy marketing because mainly it has to talk about our own experiences and what we observe. But um, I definitely like the questions. Uh, all the questions were really, really good. What I'll do is because of the time limitations, if um, you guys are on Scology, um, uh, you can post your questions into the discussion post on Scology and then I'll answer your questions. If you want to talk to me in detail about any of this, uh, my email address was shared please uh, feel free to email me. I'll be very happy to talk to you either through email, phone, Zoom, whatever works for you. Okay, thank you very much once again. Thank you, Dr. Faisal Ali. We appreciate it. Uh, also, we would like to thank for all of you. And just to reiterate, uh, we started to introduce pre-show interviews uh, to our lectures. So please be watch for them. Again, they are optional. And Dean Moez Demayem for the MoMA College of Business will be hosting a series of um, uh, guests uh, on this show. And also, I would like to tell you that um, the lectures are really watched by thousands of people. Even though we have about 6,000 uh, participants in this certificate program, our videos are watched about nine to 10,000 times. So we really thank for all of you, we made them public, so uh, you don't have to be in the certificate program. However, for those of you who are in the certificate program, I would like to remind you that a quiz will be available, just like you see on the screen. When you go into Schoology, you will see the link tonight for the uh, week number three lecture, uh, Faizan, uh, Dr. Faizan Ali's wonderful uh, lecture tonight. And again, one more time, 
the pre-show interviews are not going to be part of the uh, quizzes. Uh, we thank you for your attention and we look forward to being with you next week with another lecture and also a pre-show um, interview. Have a wonderful night.